It is a great privilege for me to be here with you, not merely because there's so many missionaries in the congregation, but because also this is a mission-minded church. But even that privilege pales in comparison to the privilege that is mine to simply speak the name of Jesus. If you're here today and you do not necessarily identify with Christianity or evangelicalism, one thing that I want you to see that is very, very important, you've seen a great deal of talent and beauty from disciplined musicians and singers. But the reason for the sound of the brass and the reason for the strings, the reason for the voices, has nothing to do with the promotion of a church. To most of us, that would be a horrid thought. All of this is for one reason, and that reason is a person, Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything for Him. The missionaries who are gathered here today, they went out for Him. The people who have sacrificially sent those missionaries, they did so for Him, for Christ. The schools that are represented here, their great and only purpose is to honor Christ by teaching Christ. And that's what I want you to see more than anything else. This is not about any human here. As a matter of fact, the greatest among us, the greatest among us, his most perfect thought, his most perfect deed, his most perfect word would not save him. Our salvation is found in this. Jesus Christ shed his own blood for our souls. And as one country preacher said many years ago, I expect to swing out into eternity on that truth. So as we talk about missionaries, know this. They go out because of their love for Christ who has saved them. Well, usually when I preach in, uh, about missions, I am teaching on missions or giving some corrective with regard to modern missions, but that is not necessary here. I am a, among friends. You know, you know that the Great Commission is about a biblical church training elder qualified men and sending them forth to plant another biblical church to train elder qualified men and to start the cycle all over again. You know that. You also know that the Great Commission is not advanced by strategies, techniques, or cultural sensitivity, but it is advanced through the proclamation of God's Word, through intercessory prayer, and through a godly, Christ-like life. And so, I won't be here today to teach on missions. I'm here today to encourage missionaries and to encourage believers. Because you need to understand this. In many ways, missionaries are special. In many ways, they're not special at all. They're just like you with a different calling. And all the weaknesses and doubts and needs that you experience in your own life here in California, I can assure you, they experience the same wherever they are. And so I want to bring a word of encouragement from Matthew 28. Now, I want to begin by you recognizing that in this passage, we see really two groups of runners coming off the blocks. We do. Two groups of runners. One is carrying a message of truth and the other group is carrying a message of errors. We see something like a great fountain opening up, bursting forth, or two great fountains bursting forth with two completely different rivers, one bringing life and the other bringing death. We have the true and faithful news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ being proclaimed by two women, and we have the denial of that resurrection being claimed by some of the officials of the Roman Empire, a denial of the truth. Now. I want, I want to look at a, a few things that are, that are very, very important. 
This is a race, a race that began 2,000 years ago and will continue. As a missionary, you're just not out there trying to preach the gospel. You need to realize that there are others who are out there trying to deny the very gospel that you preach. And the reason why I tell you that, and I'll expound upon that, is to let you know this. Missionary, please understand. We have nothing in ourselves but impotence. Nothing in our strategies but uselessness. If we are to advance the kingdom against such impossible odds, it will, we will do so by submitting ourselves to the weapons of warfare that have been given to us. And that is the proclamation of the word of God. Intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer. And a godly life. A godly, godly life. Seeking to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, I want us to look first of all at these truth bearers. Because we're going to find a lot in common that we have with them. Isn't it amazing that this, this is the focal point in human history? As a matter of fact, whether or not you believe the resurrection determines everything about you. I mean, all worldviews are shaped on this. You either believe the resurrection and what it validates, or you do not believe the resurrection. This is, this is a big message. This is a larger message than anything the Old Testament prophets, anyone had ever received. And look to whom it's given. Two women. Now, I'm not saying that in, in, in order to attempt to say that in any way women are inferior or anything else, but you need to understand the cultural setting. Most scholars believe that women were not allowed at this point in time to give testimony in a court of law. Some scholars say they were, but their testimony would be looked at as not very credible. Certainly, it wouldn't stand up to the testimony of these Roman military officials, these guards. And then you've got to realize something. It's not just two women. One of these women, seven demons were cast out of her. Now, you need to ask yourself this question, why? Well, I can also ask this question, missionary. Why did God call you? And I can certainly ask the question about myself. Why did God call me? You see, God always works in human history in such a way as to demonstrate when there is a victory, and when God's involved, there's always a victory. When there's a victory, the victory can only be attributed to Him. He uses the weakness of the world to beat down, or the weakness of the world to beat down its strength. He uses what the world considers to be foolish and impotent to confound the wise. And so when you look at yourself, when, when you look at yourself, you look in the mirror and you see yourself as, as feeble, as somewhat impotent, as, as a broken, as a master of nothing. And you wonder, why would God call me? Why would so much resources be invested in me to put me on the field when so often it's two steps forward and one step back? You need to realize this is exactly God's modus operandi. This is the way he works. He uses weakness. I always consider myself kind of the proverbial one hand behind God's back. God says basically this. Not only am I going to win this battle, I'm going to use Paul Washer to do it and make it so much more difficult. <laughs> and I know you, missionary. I know you understand that. Now, I'm not applauding weakness today. Except in this. Weakness is the route to strength. Because see, it doesn't matter how strong a man or woman you are, you can't beat this. You can't fight this battle. So God will work weakness in your life, not to leave you there weak and full of excuses, but it'll work weakness in your life in order to create dependence upon Him. And when that is achieved, there is strength and there is fruit. God is always working weakness in our lives to bring about dependence, to bring about strength. 
One of my favorite passages in the Bible, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Yes. A man can be truly used of God, a woman can be truly used of God when they see nothing in themselves and everything in the promises, faithfulness of God. Now, let's look at these women for a moment. What, what do we see in them? First of all, we, we, we see devotion. The word can also be translated consecration, separation. You know, they were among the few who followed Christ even to Calvary. Though they stood at a distance, they did stand at a distance. They didn't run away. And what was the reason for that? They loved him. They were bound to him. I prayed for a little girl this morning. And, and I prayed one of my very, very special prayers for children. Lord, I ask that this child be known for one thing. An unusual devotion to your son. That's the cure for all ailments, my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the cure. And they were. I'm reminded of a passage in, song, in the Song of Solomon 8.6. Love is as strong as death. Humankind knows no greater enemy than death. And yet love is as strong. And I can tell you this, that if you and I will cultivate this kind of love for Christ in our life, and I'm going to tell you how to do that, we will cultivate this kind of love for Christ. It will make us strong. I, I won't mention his name, but I, I have a, a friend. I remember the first time he went into the jungles with me. He was terrified of everything. He was terrified of the piranhas, of the anacondas, the alligators, the insects that get inside your body and do great deals of damage to you. Of course, maybe he was wise for being afraid of all those things. But he was terrified. I mean, I could say he was terrified of his own shadow, but I admired him so much because of his terror. It wasn't bravery. It wasn't will that drove him to be beside me. It was his love for Christ. And if he had to go trembling and weeping, he still went. Not because he was some kind of John Wayne. Simply because he loved Christ. And then I want you also to look at these women, faith. I want you to look at faith. Now, I want you to understand what's going on here. They received the word of God mediated here through an angel of the Lord. And they believed it. Now, what do I mean by that? Notice that they had joy in the message and they ran because of the message long before they saw Jesus. It was faith in the revelation of God that had been given to them. Do you see that? And then what happened? We also find recorded here that not only did they believe the message, but what did it produce in them? Great joy. So many times when this is taught, it's, it's made romantic and made impotent. Oh, the one they loved had been raised. That's true. The one they loved had been raised, and that was the reason for their joy. But, my friends, it's much larger than some personal feeling of emotion. This is cosmic. The whole world changes now. The universe changes now. Heaven changes now. Everything changes now. He has risen. So don't just make it this personal romanticism. No, this is cosmic. Everything changes. As I, I love to say, the, the lid was ripped off the tomb and the grave was filled with light. Everything changes. And they apprehended that by faith and they had joy. And then what happened? They ran. They were told to go and they did. And they went running. So the word of Nehemiah comes to be seen as true. The joy of their Lord was their strength. They ran. Now, I, I, I want to do something right now. I want to look at this because I want you to know that I've taught this long before I saw it in this passage. And it is, it is kind of foundational in my life. And I know you'll be able to identify with me in this because I am the weakest man I know. I'm the most anxious man I know. I am more prone to fear than most men. Yes. And it's what I find here that 
Whatever I can do, I can do because of this. And I want you to see it. Now, listen very carefully. There is a relationship between revelation, faith, joy, and obedience. Revelation. In our case, what are we talking about? The scriptures. Okay? And let me remind you about this. I'm talking about a closed canon. Okay? The scriptures. The infallible, inerrant word of God. The revelation of God. When it is apprehended by faith, by a regenerate heart, it will produce joy. And that joy is energizing. It is empowering. Now, let me give you an example. The revelation of God. And, and the reason why most people really struggle in their devotional life, if you really want to know, write this down because I've got the answer. It's this. A lack of a true biblical knowledge of the attributes, works, and promises of God. The more you see of his, of his righteousness, his holiness, his grace, his mercy, his beauty, his excellencies. And I'm being very Hebrew here. I'm using the plural to talk about big excellencies. When you comprehend all that he has promised to do in you, all that he's done in Christ, all that he's doing now, all that he will do, ear has not heard, eye has not seen what he has prepared for his people. When you actually understand that from the scriptures, you say, I do. No, you don't. You understand something. But this is so big that even after a million years in eternity, you will not still understand everything. That's how great this is. This revelation is ongoing. It is gigantic. Everything that God is. His beauty is so great that if he were to appear here at this moment, just a fraction of his glory were to appear, apart from being changed and having a glorified body, it would kill us all. Or it would fracture our minds to the point we, we, we'd be imbeciles for the rest of our lives. Have you ever seen a sunset and say, oh, that took my breath away? A sunset takes your breath away. And it should. God made it. Can you imagine what a biblical vision of God will do to you? And then all that he's promised. Oh, there is so much waiting for you, saint. It is so much bigger. God is going to reveal himself throughout all eternity to powers, principalities, mights, and dominions through his grace that he lavishes on you. And possibly in ever-increasing measures throughout eternity. That's what's waiting for you. When you apprehend this wonderful person, especially in Christ, in Calvary, you apprehend everything he has said about himself and what he has done and what he does and what he will do, it must produce joy. It'll produce joy in, in a dungeon. It will produce joy in the hospital. It'll produce joy when, well, whenever. And that joy, that joy is what produces obedience. That beauty of him, that love for him. That's what produces obedience. It drives us. Most people's, most people's joy is based on their own obedience without any idea of the revelation of God. That's slavery. Our obedience ought to come from the joy that comes from believing what our God says about himself. Do you see that? So what is the great need for missionaries? To know God. To know God. His attributes. His works. His promises. And that, that's just not regard, with regard to, to the matter at hand. But I want to share with you something else that's been a great help to me. When we look in the mirror, we all will say, you know, I need to love God more. Preachers will tell us we need to love God more. We tell each other we need to love God more. We lament the fact that we do not love God more than we do. But how do we fix that? I mean, how do we really 
fix that. Sometimes it's good just in the night watch when you can't sleep to ask questions like that. And to ponder scripture. Lord, I, how do I do it? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say that the building was empty and you come through the door and you see me laying on the platform on my back and I've got both hands around my belt and I'm pulling with all my might upward and grunting and you can tell it's a fierce struggle and you walk in and you go, um, Brother Paul, what are you doing? And I say, well, I'm, I'm trying to get up. I'm trying to get up. You say, well, Brother Paul, you never studied physics, did you? <laughs> if, if you're going to get up by pulling on the belt, you must be acted upon by an outside force. Someone else must grab the belt and pull you up. That's the same way with the love for God. I see constantly believers trying to twist themselves up into a greater and greater love for God. Or they'll go to some revival meeting where they acquire the fire and they get all wound up like a clock. For three days, they're wound tight. And then in two days, they completely unwind and they find themselves right back where they started. So what's the answer? For you to increase in your love for God, you must be acted upon by an outside force. And what is that outside force? Well, first of all, it requires that your heart be regenerate. Because you see, the unregenerate heart, the more it knows about God, the more it will hate Him. But the regenerate heart, the heart that has been born anew, born from above, born again, the heart that has been changed from stone to living flesh, the more it sees of the beauties, the excellencies of God, the more the affections of that heart will be drawn out, you see. I love my wife. We've been married for 25 years. And I love my wife now more than when I met her. And when I met her, man, she was drop-dead gorgeous. And she still is. <laughs> that was a dangerous statement, wasn't it? Is this recorded? <laughs> you still are. You're, you're more beautiful than when we started. I love my wife now more. Why? Because after 25 years, I've seen more of her virtue. More of her excellencies. And that virtue and that excellency has drawn out my affections. You know, we're so backward often. We see a man who really, really loves his wife and we say, what a virtuous man. What an incredible man. Well, maybe we got it all wrong. Maybe he's just a normal man. Maybe he has an exceptional wife. And the virtues of that woman draw out his affections. Did you ever think about that? But we're real fleshly like that, aren't we? We see a man who seems to have an unusual love for God. And what do we say? We talk about the man. Wow, what love he possesses for God. That's really wrong theologically. I have studied the lives of many missionaries and preachers and pastors. And I found that they all come from a common stock, Adam. And that's not a good thing. So how is it that some seem to be so exceptional in their love for God? I can only come to one conclusion. They were so different in their personalities and their manner of study. They just saw more of God than we do. And that greater vision of the beauties and excellencies and virtues and promises of God drew out their affections, drew out their joy. And compelled them to become who they were. You see, this is not just for missionaries. This is for all of us, isn't it? It really is. And so that's what I want you to see. I want you to see that. Now let's look at the error bearers for a moment. 
These were probably the same Roman military guards that were assigned over temple security. Because Rome was very concerned about the temple, that nothing happened there that would cause a riot. These men would have been trained. They would have been great observers. They would have been men who were able to communicate what they had seen correctly to other people. But, but look what happens here. They see an unnatural, something of an earthquake. They see an angel of the Lord descending. And they see an empty tomb. And they come away lying, unbelieving, lying, and deceiving. What does that tell us? Missionary right here is enough to know about missions. What, what greater sign could have been given them? What greater argument? I mean, I, I believe that when apologetics are used appropriately, they are excellent. But I mean, what greater apologetic could have been given them than, than everything they received? And yet look at what we see. Rebellion. Unbelief. And what does that tell us? The Great Commission is not advanced through signs and wonders. It is advanced through the proclamation of Jesus Christ, through the proclamation of the Scriptures, and the extraordinary regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. That's what advances missions. And the reason why I'm here today, and the reason why I speak positively of what you do, is because I have seen, not only here, but around the world where I have visited, I have seen this being propagated. And I will tell you, you know I'm, I'm not a flatterer. There are very few that are doing this. The only thing we're commanded to do. Send out elder qualified men who study the word, to live the word, to preach the word, in order to raise up other elder qualified men to study the word live the word, and preach the word. It's that simple and that difficult. Now, I want us to think about what Jesus said in Luke 16, 31. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Brethren, the weapons of our warfare, never let them go or trade them for silly things. So many missionaries and preachers today are nothing more than little boys with BB guns playing army. When they shoot, they hit nothing. And even if they hit something, their armament's not strong enough. And they're not being shot at by the devil because they're really doing his kingdom very little damage. But if you take this seriously and confine yourself only to the weapons that are given to you, you will fight hell and hell will fight you. Now, I want you to look at something in verse 11. Now, while they were on their way, this is the women, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. Now, I want you, I want you to see this running forth from the same tomb at the same time are two contrary testimonies from two contrary witnesses. Now, why do I bring this up? You as a missionary, you must fight against the flesh. You must fight against apathy, doubt, unbelief. But don't think that that's your battle. That that's the end of it. That's all you have to do. Or don't even think that the enormity of the task is what the battle is about. You need to realize that as you are going out in the name of Christ, there are countless people going out in the name of Antichrist. Countless people going out in the name of another message. When you go out to be a missionary, you need to understand you are battling against powers and principalities and mights and dominions. You are battling against a world system. You are battling against the most powerful men of that world system. You are battling against the whole of humanity that is under the devil's sway. Now, you can't fight this. 
You have to become utterly convinced of this. You can't fight this. You can't beat this with your talent, your personality, your leadership skills, your clever missionary strategies and church growth guru books. You can't fight this with that. This battle is supernatural. This battle must be won. Well, let me put it this way. If you're going to go out in his authority, as we're going to talk about tonight, you've got to go out under his authority. Submitting. Do you know what the dividing line is in this world for me? Now, I believe in the sovereign grace of God and salvation, but you, don't know, you want to know what the real dividing line is for me? Sola Scriptura. That's the dividing line. Even if you tell me you believe in inerrancy and infallibility, I'm going to yawn because that means nothing if you do not put it into practice. And putting it in practice means submission to the written word of God. Do you see that? Now, listen to what the Apostle Paul says. The weapons in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons of warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. You give me one man who will devote himself to the study of God's word, intercessory prayer, a godly life and proclamation, and I will take him over 10,000 talented personalities. Every time. Now, I want to look for a moment at the characteristics. And we only have time for this. I'm, I, I tell you what, it's, it's so hard to preach in the United States. You know, in, if I preach for an hour in, in Peru, when I get done, they go, that was a nice devotional. We'll take a five-minute break, and then Brother Paul will come back and preach. <laughs> um, but I want to look at some characteristics of these men. These men with a false testimony. First of all, I want you to look at spiritual blindness and irrationality. I mean, could any, as I have said, could any greater evidence have been given to them than an empty tomb? It's not every day you see an angel of the Lord descending. Could any greater evidence, could you, as a missionary, give them some greater proof? No, absolutely not. And one of the most well, greatest mistakes you can commit as a missionary is expect for human beings to be rational. Rationality, in a sense, is a Christian virtue that can be truly owned only by a regenerate heart and mind. Then look at self-preservation. It says in verse 14, they wanted to stay out of trouble. They would rather have the approval of men than the honor that comes from God. And then look also, greed in verse 12. They were given a large sum of money. Never, never, never underestimate the power of the love of money. It is the root of all evil. I would submit to you that that is true not only in commerce, but it is true in politics, and it is true in many ways in religion. Greed. And it is a mighty, powerful force. Pragmatism. Pragmatism is another thing. They had no conviction regarding the truth and no fear of the Lord. They knew what they saw. But they manipulated it for their own supposed convenience. The greatest characteristic of these men, however, is theological. They were spiritually dead. They had unregenerate hearts. Oh, I've heard this illustration from so many preachers, and I myself have used it, but oh, if I just take every young preacher by the hand and lead him out into a cemetery and tell him, I want you to command one of these to come up from the dead. Not a multitude, just one of them. Just one of them. That's it. And you can stay out here as long as you need to. <laughs> that is no different than preaching the gospel. You cannot change a heart. Only God can. That is, is His job. He did not give that job to you. He reserved that for His own glory. It's His prerogative. 
You are to preach. Now, why am I saying this? Why am I saying all of this? I want to, I want to conclude with this. I'm saying this because I was a missionary for many years. But I'm also saying this primarily because I don't know all the missionaries that are here, but I know some of you, and I've visited uh, some of you. And I've talked to many of you on the phone and through internet. And here's the one thing that I've discovered about you troublemakers. It's this. You go into a country, and everyone is glad to receive you. And if it was only the secular, atheistic, or apostate religions that came against you, it would feel almost like an affirmation, wouldn't it? It's like, yeah, bring on the lions. But when I've talked to you and many other missionaries, that's not your great discouragement. It doesn't discourage you when, when the Catholic Church comes after you, or secular people come after you, or, or this or that, or all these isms. That doesn't bother you. What bothers you is you, when you find these kinds of men within the realm of evangelicalism. And at first they receive you. Wow, yeah, great. But then it's discovered that you really do believe in sola scriptura. That you believe in expository preaching. That uh, you believe in a closed canon. That you believe in a biblical church Converted membership, church discipline, biblical counseling. And then what happens is, because God is working, a lot, of, a lot of men, even young men and stuff, start listening to your messages and they go, wow, this is what I've been hungering for all my life. This is it. I mean, just scripture, 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 scripture. And what happens? Whole denominations turn on you at times. People speak terrible things about you. And it breaks your heart. Let me remind you of something in my closing words. You must outstudy them. You must outpray them. You must outpreach them. And you must outlove them. Because what do you have that you have not received? And if you have received it, why do you boast? What separates you from anyone on this planet except the grace of God? That truth came home to me a few months ago. And it's really brought about a change. Instead of worrying and fretting and being angry about some of the things people say about me, I just pray that God would give them grace would bless them and strengthen them, regenerate their hearts, change their minds. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I shared with the, the earlier group, I remember when I first fell in love with the seminary here. I, I'm, I mean, you got more people here than I have in my town, I think. And the first time I was in, I got to go to chapel and sit in the back row and I was looking and I was just happy to be there. And uh, somebody in evangelicalism somewhere did something crazy or something happened. Well, all of a sudden, Dr. MacArthur walked in. I thought, oh my goodness, he wasn't supposed to be here. And I don't remember exactly what he said. I don't want to add to or take away, but he looked at the students and he said this. Don't you ever forget, you're here to study the word, to know the word, to live the word in order to preach the word. That is why you're here. It's very simple, isn't it? And it's as difficult as it is simple. I entrust you now to the grace of God. But please, please, tonight... We're going to try to do more, try to be more faithful to stick to my notes. <laughs> but what I want you to see is this. Not only is there a need for an increasing revelation of the greatness of God, but an increasing revelation of your inability. 
Not so that you wallow in weakness and never accomplish anything. But so that you learn from where true strength, spiritual strength and stamina comes. It is from utter dependence upon God and his grace in Christ. Never forget that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of speaking Christ's name. Thank you for the privilege, Lord, of being here with this church and these missionaries. Please, Lord, please let something good come of all this that we have done here today. Sanctify our offering. Bear fruit with this seed. In Jesus' name, amen.